The NBC Theater presents... Screen Directors Guild Assignment, Production, The Exile, Director, Max Opals, Star, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. This is the Screen Directors Guild presentation of the adventurous legend, The Exile, starring Douglas Fairbanks and introducing the director of the film, Max Opals. The statement that art acknowledges no national boundaries is particularly true of the motion picture medium. Thus it is with a great deal of pleasure that the NBC Theater welcomes tonight a director who received his film education in Germany and France. In him is exemplified the rare combination of talents which are the starting point of the screen director's art. Among his American motion pictures are Letter from an Unknown Woman, the soon-to-be-released production Caught, and of course tonight's story, The Exile. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Max Opals. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very pleased and flattered that tonight the Screen Directors Guild presents The Exile with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in the screen role of Charles II and Jeanette Waldo as Kay. For many years, I have had an idea about how history should be presented in the traumatic form, and the exile is that idea come to life. For me, over centuries, parts of history take on the flavor of an old ballad, singing the deeds of brave men who lived in a kind of fairyland. But... If such a quality is to be placed upon the screen, it requires a special sort of actor. He must possess a certain flair, a certain uh, something I can call only Fairbanksism. Fairbanksism is a very vital substance in movie making, a kind of glorious energy which escapes from most of us when we lose the dreams of childhood. Well, fortunately for this idea, Douglas Fairbanks came to me one day, and he said... Max, I want you to direct a picture for me. Listen, I'll tell you the story. The story begins on a stormy night in the year of our Lord, 1660. It's night, a storm with thunder and lightning, a slashing downpour of rain, and a horseman. A horseman fleeing across Holland in the middle of the 17th century. The fate not only of a nation is riding tonight, but of a way of life. A horseman riding the whole fugitive night. And the name of that horseman, Charles II, exiled King of England. In the bright morning, the exiled king is at his ease, pretending to sleep on the bank of a Dutch canal. Pretending to sleep because an enemy, a mounted man in a black cloak and a round hat, with ascetic, suspicious eyes, is riding slowly toward him. Stops without dismounting. You, peasant. Hmm? Huh? Uh, uh, good morning, good morning, good morning. Greetings in God's grace. Greetings. Greetings. And have you seen aught of a man about two yards high with black hair and impudent manner? Excuse and... me, but I, I am a stranger here, far from home, and enjoying the hospitality of these Netherlands. English? Indeed. Far from home? For what reason? Uh, <laughs> my health. God heal you, sir. And have you seen aught of the fugitive English King Charles Stuart, banished from England and hiding here? What? That scoundrel among men? That lazy, self-indulgent, wastrel of... Oh, oh, oh. Imagine England in the hands of a man like that, eh? <laughs> not if Cromwell's men discover him. You have not seen him? Is he about? We found his horse wandering exhausted in the wood. Knave, tyrant, tormentor of dumb beasts. Tur- uh, speed you on your search, sir. And may you and Charles II come face to face one day not far off. 
We shall. Farewell. Farewell, health and long life, countrymen. My thanks, countrymen. My thanks. Ah, I must be on the move. But where? Where? You. You there on the bank. Hmm? Oh. Ahoy, canal boat. Can you help me? I can't keep this barge in midstream. Well, keep it headed straight. I'll, I'll jump aboard from the bridge. Well, hurry. Plenty of time now, lass. Plenty of time. Now, steady as you go. Steady. I'm trying. All right. Now. Ah. Oh. So, uh, quick, hand me the pole. Here. Good. Hold it against your shoulder. I see. And push. I have it now. Oh, oh that's so much better. Jan would have been furious if I had grounded his barge. Jan? Who's Jan? He owns the boat. He lets me use it if I haul his cargo. Is he your master? My cousin. Healthy? Very. Muscular? A huge man. And he lets you do his heavy work, does he? He owns the farm next to mine, and he owns the debts on my farm and my inn. Three thousand guilders I owe Jan. You have a farm and an inn, eh? Ever since my father died. Tell me, this, this farm and inn of yours, is it, is it close? Not yet. I must anchor another night. Good. Why? I, uh, I find leisurely travel sometimes very soothing. And uh, you need help with this barge in swollen waters, don't you? Uh, yes. Good, good. Well, I come from a seafaring nation. Consider me your crew. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon that bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. How pretty. What is it? William Shakespeare, a poet who had his day, oh, 50 years ago. Soon forgotten, but while he sang, he sang right beautifully. Oh. Charles. Hmm? I was just trying the name. Try it again. Charles. Again. <laughs> was not your English king named Scottish, Charles? Scottish, Scottish king. Oh. Charles Stuart and the Scot. They say he was the most scandalous man. Mm, a little rakish at times, but not too bad. They say it is dangerous for an Englishman to side with the exiled king in these times. Well, it's a little inconvenient at times, yes. But, uh, <laughs> and that, that, that is why I wonder, Mistress Katie, if I could hide with you for a while. How? Why, I could work on your farm and at the inn. I, I, I should ask nothing in return but shelter and board. Now, tell me, how, how would you say, could you use an extra man in Dutch? Could you an extra man gebruiken? Could you an extra man gebruiken? Well, well, could you? Yes. Good. <laughs> Good. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon that bank. It is very lovely. You are lovely. Are you sure he will be soon forgotten, this... this film Shakespeare? If he says such true and lovely things? For weeks, the exiled king works at Katie's farm and inn, willingly, even gladly, performing the most menial labor. Only his cavalier friends in The Hague have been told of his new hideout. And now, one day again, history rides the Dutch lowlands. Your Majesty! Your Majesty! Hide, old friend! I have news from England. Come, come, come. Hi, you, you you might have been followed here. Hi, but the news warrants great risks. Oh? Your Majesty, General Monk has declared for us. General Monk? On our side? Even now, his army marches against the Roundheads. England is split oh, into more oh. factions than ever. <laughs> and General Monk thinks the country would rally to your side if you returned now. Return? Now? At once, Your Majesty. I'm sorry, Hyde. No. But with Monk on our side now, how can we fail? I said no, Hyde. These no. men are hungry. They yearn for home and family. I know. Ten long years in exile. I know majesty. that too. Bitterly enough. Is this a time to show hesitation and fear and doubt? Fear? Who speaks of fear? 
Great heaven, man, for two years after Cromwell killed the king, my father, I fought and met defeat, wasting the blood of men who trusted in me. And all because our hopes were false. False! I was told the three kingdoms would rise behind me to a man until I faced the enemy. And I was left alone with a handful of men. Brave men, but beaten beforehand and doomed in advance by false, false hopes. False hopes, false starts, false promises. And always the blood of free men uselessly forfeit. Now, I'll go home, Hyde, when I am freely called by all my countrymen. And not before. The men are ready now. They, they call you leader. King. King. What good's a king who's only king to some? <sighs> so be it, sir. There is other news, uh, not quite so favorable. Colonel Ingram is in Holland. Ingram? Here? That is evil news. If there is one man in Christendom I fear above another, that man is the executioner Ingram. Oh. Describe the man to me so I'll know him if we meet. Think of the face and habit of death, and that is Ingram. His skin is parched and yellow like a dead man's. His lips are a straight white gash across his face, and his eyes burn with a light like grave worms in their bony sockets. A consecrated. A fanatic, fearing nothing. Naturally, what is death himself to fear? Charles, if you will not return to England, then flee. Flee Ingram? <laughs> I think not, Hyde. No, otherwise the cause is lost, Your Majesty. Flee where? Holland is overrun with Cromwell's spies and swordsmen. Besides, Charles! I... Charles, where are you? Besides, I... I like it here. In spite of Ingram. You are listening to the Screen Directors Guild production of The Exile, starring Douglas Fairbanks and introducing the director of the film, Max Opals. Two weeks more, two more weeks of idyllic pastoral life on Katie's farm. Then one afternoon, Charles is fishing in the canal, for if a cat may look at a king, then <laughs> a king may look for a catfish. Unheard by him, a figure dressed in tarnished regal clothing moves up behind him, leading a moth-eaten horse. Are you a Hollander? Huh? A Dutchman? Huh? Oh, 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 good day, sir, good day, good day. I'm told there is an inn hereabouts. An excellent inn, my lord, I know, for I work there. Ah, but you're English. True. What, uh, uh what is your uh, capacity at the inn? I have been promoted to overseer. Excellent. A fellow exile and an overseer. Mm. Uh, uh, tell me, um... What uh, costs bed and board uh, to a fellow uh, countryman, you know? Uh, two guilders a night. Uh, two uh, guilders. Hmm. Suppose I tell you in all confidence and that when I have spent the night at your inn, you may charge the next guest 20 guilders without protest, for you may tell him honestly, a king slept in this inn. Eh? King? Which king? Look at me. And though these English garments be the worse for hardship, and though my liniments be weathered and war beaten, say, if you can, that you do not recognize your king, Englishman. Not, not Charles Stuart. And the wandering exile Stuart. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, sire. Arise and lead me to your inn. You and your employer shall be rewarded handsomely uh, someday. <laughs> Charles, did you finally get his majesty, our guest, to sleep? Uh, finally, yes. He is very indiscreet for a fugitive, Charles. Very indiscreet. Letting all those strangers in the tap room know who he is, but swearing us to secrecy. I tell you, he'll bring Cromwell's roundheads down on us looking for him. Charles, he worries me. He told me he wants you with him when he invades England again. Oh? oh. And when, when may this be? He said, soon. Uh-huh. It's all so stupid and wasteful. 
There are far better things to do than quarrel over politics and kingdoms and all that rubbish. Ah, we disagree there, Katie. England is a nation of some seven million people who, who, who depend on their leaders. We, we owe them some sort of debt of... Debt of... nonsense. You men will always find some excuse to start fighting and to be very proper about it. Debt indeed. Now, I have a debt. A real one that you can count and that means something to plain people. Three thousand guilders. I know. I... I... I gave you a job and shelter when you wanted it, and and now you plan to leave me for that... that... that dear head. If my king calls me, Katie, I... You will desert me. I will follow my call. Then... Then I will not need your services any longer, Charles. I'm dismissed? Yes. Now? I... I will not spend my time and my money teaching you farming and, and, and management of an inn and see it all go to waste over politics. It is best you leave before... Before... Before what? Before I, I come to depend on you too much. I understand. I'll leave in the morning. Good night, Mistress Katie. in yes English yes I've seen you before somewhere it may be tell me plainly of which party are you party the parliamentary party you mean the roundheads do you call them so candidly sir if I ever see my home again I shall belong to no party I have recently renounced politics then perhaps I can trust a man without any convictions. I suppose that depends on the trust. I am looking for a man whose face I have not seen in many years. Rumor places him hereabout. His name is Charles Stuart. You refer to the king? We call him Charles Stuart. What? Who down there takes the name of his sovereign, Charles II of England? The fool. Pompous idiot. And what is this? A despised round head in royal presence. Bear your head. Bear your head, I say. I remove my hat only in the presence of God and in the presence of death. Ah, uh, uh, sire, this, this gentleman here is looking for an uncrowned king. Uh, uh, the, the, the gentleman's name is Ingram. Uh, the executioner? Your servant, sire. I'll... Uh, Retire to my room. Wait. Uh, I'm tired. You shall sleep soundly. Oh, no, no, no. Draw your sword. No, no, no. Please, I, I, I'm not really the king. I, I'm not the king. I, I'm an actor. Uh, Dick Pinner, Pinner, Pinner. Pinner's my name. Draw your sword. But I'm just an actor. A poor, out-of-work actor. Believe me, please, believe me. Enough, Ingram. The jest is over. What jest? Oh, can't you tell a knave from a king? Look at me, Ingram. Look at me. Spare this craven fool clowning for his keep and look at me. Surely you know a steward when you see one. Look at me. To be sure. Stuart. To be sure. Pinner, slide me your sword quick. Thanks. Now, see how it is to deal with an armed steward for a change. Charles Stuart, I charge you to surrender. You are trapped, Stuart. My men surround the inn. In my service at this inn, I learned a famous recipe for rabbit pie. It goes like this. First, catch the rabbit. And keep a firm grip on your sword. <laughs> Remember it, Ingram. Long live the king. Robbins, fellow, all of you. Colonel Ingram, after him, men, dead or alive. you? What is the meaning of this? 
You are the mistress of this inn. But what if I am? Where is he? Who? The Englishman who works here. If you mean Charles, my retainer. Where is he? What right have you to invade a Dutch house and hound a hard-working man to death because he is loyal to his king? Don't play the fool with me. He is the king. Charles? The king? It's plain you're innocent in that matter. But mind you, don't shield the man if you would remain innocent in the matter. What now, Colonel Ingram? It's plain from her manner that Stuart's more than handyman to her. Watch her. She'll lead us to him. Katie, you shouldn't have come here. They'll not admit to search around this windmill. Charles, that... That man with the face like a skull. He told me who you are. And, and let me tell you in a few moments what I wanted to spend my life telling you. I love you, Katie. Above all things, deeply and, and gratefully. Gratefully? Why? Because in your love, I've found a few precious moments of shelter. I've learned from you another life than fear and flight and battlefields and parliaments. If I should die, remember that I loved you. Not as King Charles, doubtful monarch of a restless realm, but as Charles, master of his own soul. Charles, look, they're coming. I knew it. Quick, inside the mill. Here. Against this wall, hide behind these sacks. single-handed. He's coming in alone. God be with you, Charles. Charles Stewart. Stewart, how will you die? I give you this chance to face me alone, for I would relish killing you with my own blade. Stewart! I am here. Defend yourself, killer. Rejoice, O England. Thy deliverance is at hand. <laughs> oh, well spoken, sir. You write your own epitaph. Well, we'll finish this alone. You and I. You'll die for that vanity. I'll live for my beliefs. And I for mine. Back, Inquisitor. What? You give ground to a steward? <laughs> back, I say, back. Rusty. Ah. Rust, Ingram, is the color of old blood. Your crimes are upon you, killer. Back. Up the stairs. Blasphemer. Back. Back, I say, up! Ungodly Stuart! Why? Because I think God made men free. Die! <laughs> Another time, Ingram. Not just now. Die! You must die if England is to live. Rot. England will live no matter what happens to either of us. On guard! Killer! Heaven. Charles, listen. Outside. There's trouble. And surely roundheads do not make trouble for other roundheads. Your Majesty! Your Majesty! Hide! Hey, How? What? Hey, are you all right? Yes, I, I am all right. Oh, thank God you're safe. I bring great news, great news. Oh? A new free parliament has, on behalf of all the people and all beliefs, asked you to return to England as their king. Religious freedom for all and, and all the rest? Everything. Oh. Will you... Will you leave me alone with Katie for a moment? Your Majesty. Katie. I... I know, Charles. What shall I do? What your heart tells you, Your Majesty. Charles, no. Your Majesty, you are my Charles, but you're their king. And they are so many, and I am one. But if that one is all... Your people are hurt. There are many wounds for you to tend. But 
what will happen to you? Oh, I will have many things to do. I, I'm going to plant more tulips in the west field bordering the road, and, and my inn will be famous now, and I shall pay my debts. Katie. And my memories will be my greatest fortune. And mine. And all these memories I'll put like rose leaves in a box. And I shall love you always, beyond measure, beyond proof, beyond battle and the folly of nations, beyond life, where we shall meet again. Charles. England is at the door. Coming. One kiss to last forever. Coming. Coming. Gentlemen, the king. I shall love you always, beyond measure, beyond proof, <laughs> beyond battle and the folly of nations, beyond life, where we shall meet again. The NBC Theater has presented the Screen Directors Guild production of The Exile, starring Douglas Fairbanks with Janet Waldo and introducing the director of the film, Max Opals. Next week, the NBC Theater brings you the world-famous screen director, Alfred Hitchcock, introducing the delightful comedy, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, with Robert Montgomery in the starring role. And now, here again are tonight's stars, Douglas Fairbanks and Janet Waldo and screen director, Max Opals. Doug, this has been the way you told me the story? Yes, yes, and you said you'd direct the picture. It must have been quite an experience for two such talented artists as yourselves to work together. Yes, there's one of Mr. Fairbank's accomplishments I shall never forget. His acting? Sure, and uh, his practical jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Max, how can you say such a thing? Well, one day I had a birthday and they bring me such a beautiful cake on the set. But when I tried to cut it, a disaster. Why? It was made out of wood. <laughs> Very embarrassing. <laughs> but when Doc brought out a real cake, then we had a nice party. Well, you see, we really loved you after all, Max. It's so nice. And, uh, but for your practical jokes, I forgave you when I saw your la latest picture, The Fighting Old Flynn. Did you like it, Max? I'm very glad. It's to be released next month, you know. Yeah, I liked it very much. Miss Waldo, it's about a dashing, romantic Irishman who does the most amazing things you have ever seen, just to win the lady he loves. It sounds wonderful. Mr. Fairbanks, I understand that besides starring in The Fighting of Flynn, you also wrote it and produced it. Well, yes, that's right. But I, I hope you enjoy it too, Janet. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And good night to you, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Janet Waldo, and Max Opus. Tonight's cast included Raymond Burr, Carl Harvard, Paul McVeigh, Joe Grandy, and Lou Krugman. The Exile was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger, and original music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Production was under the supervision of Howard Wiley, your announcer, Frank Barton. The Exile was presented through the courtesy of the Fairbanks Company and of Universal International Pictures, now releasing Criss Cross, starring Burt Lancaster, Yvonne DiCarlo, and Dan Duryea. Listen again next week when the NBC Theater presents... Screen Directors Guild Assignment... Production, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Director, Alfred Hitchcock. Star, Robert Montgomery. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.